Halloween Fun by Navy Wife JP I have more under my belt, but here's a memory from when I was younger. My dad was the coolest guy on the block, probably because he was one of the three black dads who lived in our town. The population is around 98% Caucasian, and that's not an exaggeration. He was a state police officer, intimidating, wore Oakleys before the hipsters, and he was generally a rough-sounding person. Damn do I miss him. But the one thing he feared the most was Halloween. He would tell my sister and I stories at night about his life when he was in high school in slums in New Jersey, and that every Halloween, crazy things would happen. He may have been pulling our legs a bit, but at that stage in our lives, we didn't care. When Halloween would roll around, he would take us out while Mum stayed home to trick or treat. One night in fifth grade, Lexi and I were dressed as a witch and a 50s poodle skirt girl. Dad held our hands, walking to the last street, when I realized I'd lost Mom's scarf she'd let me borrow. She loved that old thing, so we walked all the way back towards the darker corner of our street to find it. It's by the woods in a small stream, and in the daylight you can see pretty well, but when it's dark, you can't see anything. Dad said he'd seen something and walked towards it. When he'd got there, he started slowing down. He was staring at something in the dark that we couldn't see. Lexi called out to him if he'd found Mom's scarf. He told her to be quiet and started crouching down, looking into the distance. For several minutes, we stood there waiting. I could make out the scarf above his head, tied to a branch... He grabbed the tight scarf, still staring into the dark, and started backing away. Then Dad screamed and sort of shuffled backwards. It was a low, throaty scream like he was furious. He was swearing, but I don't remember what. Whatever Dad had been staring at then bolted out of the trees and ran down the street opposite of where we lived. It was a little child probably a boy, from his silhouette shape, and in a black costume with skeleton bones on the front and a skull mask. When Lexi and I tried to go over and see what happened, Dad yelled for us to stay back. He got onto his ancient cell phone and called Mom to come and pick us up. His next call was to the local police. Lexi and I left before we could see anything. But the next day, Mom told us about the dead, skinned animals that had been found. By the time us kids could go look, they'd taped off the place and taken out the bloody animals. But there were still the stains on the pavement, and the smell was absolutely terrible. The kids talked about it in school a little, and I was curious if they'd ever caught the boy. Nothing came out in the local papers, though, and it was quickly forgotten. Eventually, Dad could have told me more, but it was the last Halloween we'd spend together. But I do remember him and Mom arguing for the next couple of days about ever letting us trick-or-treat again. Halloween Eve by P. Sprouse I actually have two stories I'd like to share but I'm waiting on permission to share the one that happened to my best friend, which I was also heavily involved in. So I'll start with the one that happened to my own family. Back in 2008, I think, I had graduated high school, but was still living at my parents' house, along with my younger brother and sister, who at the time were in high school and junior high, respectively. It was Halloween Eve, meaning the next day was Halloween, and we were all asleep in our beds. Now, I have to tell you that although we lived on a nice-ish street, we lived in a town known for gangs and drug deals and random crazy weirdos. It was a little scary to hear gunshots and police sirens in the distance every night, but hey, it was home. Anywho, about at 4 a.m., I woke up to what sounded like a gunshot on our front porch, followed by a shouting and violent pounding on our front door. 
I, being curious, but also scared out of my mind, creeped up to my second floor window and peered out the front yard that had an obstructed view of the porch. This was all I could see, and aside from hearing a regular stream of cursing and more pounding on the door, I had no clue what was going on for what seemed like hours. But in reality, it probably was no more than 20 minutes. Finally, and quite startlingly I might add, my brother came bursting into my room and asked if I was okay. I told him yes, and what in the name of heck is going on? Also, if you get that reference, you're streets ahead. He told me this. Some weirdo was at our front door. He had knocked on the door, and my dad had heard and went to see what was happening. He peered through the glass and saw a man on our front porch, to whom he asked what was wrong, without opening or unlocking the door. The man answered, They're after me! Repeatedly while glancing back behind him. My dad, seeing that there was no one behind him on the dimly lit street, asked if he would like to use our phone. The guy said yes, so my dad grabbed a house phone and handed it to him through the doorway he had cracked open. The man tried to push his way in, but thankfully dad stopped him and locked the door. He then proceeded to call the police on the phone the man had opted not to take. That was the story up to that point when my brother came in to check on me. Isn't he such a nice brother? At that point, the man had started screaming profanities, yanking the door handle back and forth violently and pounding on the walls. And then I heard the glass shatter. The man had taken a chair from the front porch and thrown it through the front window, which led to my parents' bedroom. I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure I was bawling at this point knowing for sure that he was now in the house. And I remember I woke up to what I thought was a gunshot. I thought about how he was going to kill my parents first and then run upstairs and kill me and my brother. My mind raced at all the horrible things that could be happening downstairs when amazingly the police pulled right up at that moment. They immediately came into the house and detained the guy. Apparently he had climbed through the window cutting himself on the glass, and crawled on all fours through my parents' bedroom and through the kitchen. Finally, ended up on our living room floor, where he just laid down and bled all over the carpet. He didn't have any weapons on him, and despite my original theory of him having a gun, I guess I thought, in my rudely awoken state, that the pounding on the door was a gunshot. He was apprehended before he did anything to anyone in my family, thankfully. We think he was just a druggie who was hallucinating that someone was chasing him or some shit. No charges were filed, and we never saw the guy again. After the police and ambulance left, my dad cleaned up what he could of the bloody mess, and we all went to bed. Unfortunately, we all forgot about my little sister, who was downstairs in the bedroom in the back of the house. No one had gone to check on her, and no one had told her what had happened after it was all over. So she spent the entire night cowering under her blankets, thinking something could still be happening. God damn. We have since all apologized to her. So that's my story. Even though it was the most frightening experience of my life thus far, at least something good came of it, right? Since he bled all over our carpets, our insurance paid for new carpet, which we already desperately needed, and it was enough to carpet several new rooms, way more than were actually ruined. So there's that. The Most Eventful Halloween by KRC1130. The events happened in October 2013, obviously since it's Halloween. I was 10 years old and in the sixth grade. Where I am from, the middle schools got out after the elementary and high schools. As a result, my friends and I knew that we would have to start trick-or-treating immediately if we wanted to get any candy at all. 
remember Halloween of 2013 was on a Friday. This really excited us. We could hit every house we wanted and didn't have to worry about school the next day. After school, our parents picked us up and drove us to our friend, Alex's house. He lived on a road named South Herald. To the left of South Herald was an identical street named South Concord. At the end of one side of South Herald was a turn that brought you to South Concord. On the other side was the main road. Alec lived closer to the main road, so our plan was to start at his house, go to the main road, then turn up and go down Concord. After that, we'd go back down Harold and return to Alec's house. So we began trick-or-treating. There was probably twelve of us, or so I remember, but the notable ones were Alec, myself, Nate, and James. We had been accruing a great deal of candy when we got to this fateful house. It was unlike any other house. Two stories, a garage, front lawn, etc. However, there was a Michael Myers statue in the front lawn. We went up to the house, got candy, and examined the statue closely. It was holding a hideous knife and was hunched over. James suddenly decided that it would be a good idea for us to kick in the shin and and do a little Halloween vandalism. Suddenly, the statue jumped and began holding its shin. We were frightened that the statue was actually a dude. I'm gonna kill you, said the man. Obviously, plenty of people claim to want to kill someone and not really mean it. At the time, we just assumed that it was an idle threat and continued on our way. At like 8.30, it was pretty dark out. I lived up north at the time, and anyone who lives up there can agree that it gets dark pretty quickly. Anyway, we were still collecting candy when Nate and I began discussing the science behind slasher films, like who gets offered up first and why. One of the people we were with, who was in the middle of the pack, dropped his bag of candy suddenly. We all stopped and waited for him to pick it up. Now the person had to turn around to pick up his bag. When he lifted up his head, he began to squint as if he was trying hard to see something. We all turned to see what he was looking at. And then we saw the Michael Myers costume walking behind us. It was odd. No one else was with him. Hell, we were the only group on the road. He was still holding on to the knife. When he noticed we were looking at him, he quickened his pace. Being stupid preteens, we booked it. Looking over my shoulder, I realized he was starting to run too. Fortunately for my slow ass, he was a decent length behind us. Our luck even turned more into our favor when a minivan stopped at the end of Concord. It was one of our friend's mothers. We all piled into the minivan and quickly told her that someone was chasing us. She drove us all back to Alec's house. What makes this story even worse is that Alec and Nate told me that the man was still roaming the streets after we had all left. I don't think I really have felt so terrified. Honestly, I have never left the house on Halloween ever since. Whether the knife this guy had was real or not is irrelevant to me. It's one of those things that I had no intention of knowing. You know, just in case it was real and all. I suppose this story pales in comparison to some of the other experiences here, and I'm not really much of a storyteller. Still, I hope you enjoy my misfortune. (laughs) TLDR. Go trick-or-treating, see a dude in the lawn. Later, the same dude chases us with a knife. Alone on Halloween by Tasha Lou 96 This all happened back in 2014. I went out on a night for Halloween during my first year at university. I was wearing high-heeled boots and a leather jacket. Over the course of the night, drunk me had taken them off and left them at the group's table due to being too uncomfortable as I'm sure you can imagine. By the end of the night, I'd practically danced my way to near sobriety and went to my group's table. However, they'd gotten up from the table and my boots and jacket were nowhere to be seen. Someone had stolen them. 
Whatever, they weren't expensive, and I rarely wore them anyway. Now, however, I had to walk the fifteen minutes back to my accommodation. I didn't have any money for a taxi, so I thought I'd just walk back slowly. I asked one guy, the jerk in the group that everyone hated, if he could just keep me company, because he was tall. He laughed, and said no, and walked off, dragging the only girl who was also shoeless with him. So I was walking alone, shoeless in a busy city center, watching out for broken glass or anything that would be harmful or disgusting. Everyone else was so far ahead that I couldn't see them, but I just kept going. I was about halfway to my place when I was stopped by a Middle Eastern man. The city I lived in was very culturally diverse. He asked if I was okay, and I was grateful someone cared enough to make sure I was alright. He offered even to help walk me home, so I accepted for at least part of the way. He was very kind, and told me his name was Omar. He started saying how beautiful he thought I was, and how lucky he was to have me. This unsettled me slightly. Once I was around the corner from my house, I thanked Omar and said I'd walk the rest of the way on my own. He instantly looked offended. Don't you want to invite me in for a cup of tea to thank me? I told him no, because I didn't know him at all. He kept hold of my wrist. Why can't I have a kiss for helping you? Again I declined, and his grip tightened. Well, do I get a hug for being your friend, then? By this point I just wanted him to let go, so I gingerly gave him a hug. Then he grabbed me and tried to kiss me, and I pressed my lips together instead. He just licked up my face. I finally got free and started walking away, but he followed me. I sped up, and so did he. I abandoned my checking for glass on the ground and began sprinting, now terrified as I heard him running behind me. I got out my phone and called my friend Rob, who I begged to help me. But then I found out Omar was no longer following me. He was nowhere to be seen. But I needed someone to keep me safe. My friend thankfully agreed, and he got to my flat not long after, with a knife in case Omar was still there. I told the people in my group my story, and they were mortified that they left me alone. I returned home for a week because I was so thoroughly shook up. Now on a night out, I make sure everyone is so close to me that it won't happen again, or to anyone else. Burning Corpses in a Car Before Halloween by Circet Asen Man This story happened the night before Halloween back in 2010. At that time, I was a freshman in college, living on campus. That has significance later on. That year, the 31st fell on a Monday, so student festivities went on the Saturday before. During the afternoon at around seven, I was outside playing soccer on a field near to my place when I noticed an SUV driving by several times. I only noticed this vehicle because we were kicking the ball over the fence several times by accident, and that car was present at least twice when we climbed over the fence to retrieve the ball. I didn't think much of it at the time and proceeded to go to the party later that night. My girlfriend and a few friends and I left around 9.30, and we noticed a helicopter in the sky with a bright floodlight attached to it, seemingly scanning the area. We proceeded to party, and I didn't fret over it. The party was on the other side of the campus, and so we missed all the sirens and flashing lights racing up and down the street. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let me go back for a minute. We got back from the party at around 11 p.m., and I immediately noticed that not only was the first helicopter still in the air around my campus apartment, but that there was a steady stream of police cars, ambulances, and fire trucks driving up and down the street nearby. However, none of them had their lights or sirens on, so I wasn't really alarmed. The next day on the internet, though, 
I found that an SUV had been found blazing in the parking lot with a woman's body inside. What was more, I found out this happened about half to three quarters of a mile from where I lived. I guess during the party the area was crawling with police and other authorities, all trying to look for clues. My roommate later told me that there were non-stop sirens for a good 20 minutes after I left for the party. In the next few weeks, more info surfaced, saying that a man had killed his wife and tried to burn the body. He broke her neck as well and bludgeoned her body. If the news articles below are to be trusted, slight discrepancies with timing of course, the killer was lighting his wife's body on fire during the exact same time I was getting dressed up in my Woody costume. But it wasn't until a few weeks later that I made a connection between the SUV I saw in the article and the one I'd seen while playing soccer. I found out that while I was playing soccer, someone was driving within 20 yards of me with a corpse in their car, especially since it was on the campus of a very secure university in a very safe city. After reading the article in more detail, the teeth did indeed belong to the victim. My guess is the murderer hit his wife so hard in the teeth that they were knocked into her throat.